There is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding surrounding batteries, surrounding lithium ion batteries, the future of them, the price of them, the chemistries and all that. Uh, where are they today? What is the cost curve actually doing? Are they still getting better? How much room is there left to go? These are all big, big questions. And I have small, small answers. So I figured I would bring on an expert. I got Jordan Giesegi from The Limiting Factor. If you think you know batteries and you're not aware of Jordan Giesegi's work, you don't know nothing yet. Uh, I'm Brian. Welcome to Futuraza. Oh, 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 oh. Jordan, long time no chat. How have you been? Been pr uh, doing pretty good. Excited about the new year and all the things that uh, I hope come this year. So, it's yeah. yeah. This is uh, there's a few things on the roadmap, um, and uh, they all require batteries. You know, I well, you know, AI doesn't require batteries. It does. It does. Because you got to smooth the power coming in from the grid uh, to keep your operations running with absolute perfection in terms of uh, the of the voltage. So let's start with last summer, you handed me a 4680 and said, hey, man, could you do me a favor? Could you drive this a few thousand miles to San Diego? And I said, absolutely. I would be honored. And I did so. Uh, Shirley Mung and her team tore into it. What were the results? What did we find that was that makes the 4680 special? Well, what we found is even though it doesn't have silicon in it yet, it's on par with uh, the best uh, high energy density battery cells, mass volume, high energy density battery cells on the market today. So that it's um, Tesla is delivering. Uh, we just now it's just a matter of scaling it up and making hopefully we see in the next quarterly earnings call that they confirm that they now are able to do the dry coating on both the cathode and, and anode at scale, that they're starting to ramp that. Because the battery cell that I tested, it was still dry coated on the anode and wet coated on the uh, cathode. So that's that's the last hurdle from my perspective. If they can crack that, it's gonna, they're gonna be riding down the cost curve really fast. And you know, the, there's a lot of people who say, well, why can't, why can't they just ramp faster? Why can't all these companies just build more factories? This problem is not exclusive to Tesla. We see other companies, CATL, BYD, Panasonic, when they announce a new factory, it is years until it's complete. Is that because the voltage precision means that the entire process needs to be more precise? Because if I wanted, if I'm a little Chinese company and I want to spin up a factory making lead, you know, lead acid or, or, uh, alkaline batteries, I imagine you could do that much more quickly. Yes. The, I don't know much, I don't really know anything about lead acid batteries or like alkaline batteries, things like that. But at least for lithium ion batteries, there's an extraordinary degree of precision and durability that's required out of those battery cells. The layers that we're talking about here are like the width of a human hair or um, in the particles of the, like the size of a red blood cell. So even if your machinery is just slightly off, everything's a mess. And like when you're talking about something, the thickness of a human hair, you can't have um, more variability than just a few percent. Otherwise at the cell level, you get cells with variability of a few percent and you can't match those cells in a vehicle. They have to be perfectly matched when they go in. You can find videos on YouTube of alkaline battery factories and they look primitive. They look simple. They look like you could build one in your own neighborhood for a million or two. Uh, whereas if you've seen these battery factories, they look like a clean room. And I think they are mm. clean rooms. They are extremely precise. And of course, if you're, when you're draining that kind of voltage at that kind of pace, you need precision. So you've seen what the 4680 was six months ago. You've seen what it was two years ago, two years probably now. Do you think uh, apart from the cathode, being dry potentially now, do you see any other changes that may have already taken place that we're not aware of? You mean, uh, so there's the the first cell that I tore down and then the second cell that I tore down and I, I reported all the, the differences there. Like one of those differences was the, you know, the thickness, of the, the thickness of the cell can and how it's all constructed and welded together. And I did get a little tip that came out after that video that it wasn't worth making a whole video on, but they've significantly reduced the resistance in that battery cell as well. Mm. So it should generate less heat and have better charge discharge capabilities. So that's a little snippet for you that nobody else knows yet. <laughs> Put it here first. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
we've seen prices plummeting on lithium batteries around the country, around the world, really. And one of the reports said that it might be because uh, there is an oversupply of LFP and other lithium ion batteries in China, which could artificially drive the price down. We know that the lithium mineral costs itself have improved. Are the prices we're seeing today temporary or are they going to go back up? Or are they still falling? Do we have any idea on that at this time? I don't know the intricacies of the market, but what I do know is the way that the lithium ion battery market and most markets move in general over time is uh, it kind of moves in waves, uh, especially as the technology is developing. Uh, you have, you'll have a price spike or a demand surplus or demand shortage, and that, that drives peaks and valleys. Uh, when there's a shortage of battery cells, the prices go up and that drives a whole bunch of investment. So like two or three years ago, we saw a lot of money entering the battery space. We saw all these startups. We saw lithium prices through the roof. Well, now we're in the hangover period of that. <laughs> there's there's a glut of battery cell supply and materials, et cetera. And there's actually um, a shortage of demand for those. So you have two things going on at once, excess materials, excess battery supply, and then uh, not much demand. So that's what's driven the prices down. Now, I think in the next few years, we could see prices go up a little bit, but they never go up to where they were before as a side effect of that kind of roller coaster on the way down. Now, the projections are saying, you know, yeah, the, the prices will generally keep coming down. Yeah, there could be some peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. um, but if we know anything about technology, it's that as it uh, matures, it does get cheaper. And especially with technology. Um, and once these factories are precision dialed in and running well, they'll just run them until the wheels fall off. And that's why you'll see uh, chips where 15 years ago, these cost, you know, $100 each. Now they're two, three, four dollars $4 each. Uh, and when that machine breaks, they don't replace them because we have to go back to being $100. Uh, the marginal cost is not what makes it up. So if we're looking at that, then the question I would really have on that is uh, the lithium itself. Now, you and I had talked once, there are different types of lithium, and some of it is not suited to batteries. The uh, spodumene, it, it's the, the rock lithium is better than the, the brine lithium. Is that a thing? Um, well, it depends on what you're, uh, you, yeah, as you pointed out a second ago, it depends on what you use the lithium for. There's different sources of lithium that are better for end use cases. Like uh, there's uh, the two end types of lithium that are used in manufacturing are lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate. Lithium carbonate is generally considered uh, the less costly lower quality version that's used in like LFP batteries and the lithium hydroxide is what's used in uh, uh, high nickel battery cells. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So that can, so it could be that. So, I mean, it's not like you can't use them. It's just a uh, uh, light, sweet, crude versus tar sand. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And you can convert between lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate and just add some extra cost. And that's what a lot of these companies will do. They'll take a, uh, low quality lithium from low quality sources, create lithium carbonate, and then refine it again and turn it into like lithium hydroxide. Okay. And mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, have you been following Corpus Christi at all? Loosely. Uh, that's as I, close as I think anyone can follow it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's, it's getting close because I think they f just ran their first batch of uh, lithium through the kiln. Through Is the first correct? kiln, yes. The yeah. first step of the very many steps uh, has been tested. And it's also the simplest step. It is just a rotating kiln kind of kind of thing. Um, how important do you think that's going to be in the future? This was announced at a time when lithium prices were sky high. Uh, it looks like they are moving forward with the, with the plant at a normal pace. Um, mm -hmm. I looked at the timeline of other lithium refineries around the world and saw that this is about what you would expect in terms of a timeline. It doesn't appear to be expedited like so many of Tesla's projects are. The uh, Gigapactory Shanghai was clearly expedited because it is a money printing machine. Get the printers rolling. Um, will a U.S. lithium refinery stand a chance of being cost competitive uh, against ones in lower labor countries. Yes. Um, my understanding is Tesla's 
plant uses a more efficient process that creates less, uh, less environmental waste. It's overall a more environmentally and more efficient process. And then you don't have to ship that lithium all over the world. And sometimes, as we said a moment ago, refine it more than once to get to the end, uh, the end product that you need. And my understanding is it's going to be more flexible in terms of all the different types of material inputs that it can take. So uh, there should be quite a few efficiencies built in there. However, I don't think that's the main reason they're doing it. For me, it's strategically critical that we have a supply chain separate from China. A lot of the materials that China refines are just from like Australia, South America, etc. It goes there, then it comes to the U.S. They have, a, they have the full midstream on lockdown. So some of that midstream manufacturing and process needs to happen here uh, for supply chain stability. And so, and also because... China tends to use its advantages as leverage in the market. And if they have leverage over you, they're going to use it eventually. So mm -hmm. Tesla doesn't want China to have that leverage over them. They won't say that because they have to be nicey-nice, but that's my perspective. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think China's alone in that. I think the mm. U.S. and other countries have done that as well. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Well, they've been nice to me so far. <laughs> that, that bill's coming due. Don't you worry. Uh I would agree with all of that. Um, and it shortens the supply chain, which is good. Uh, having production as close to where the product is going to be as possible reduces emissions, reduces costs, reduces time. Um, but yes, having your own supply chain, we discovered during the pandemic when, when goods were not moving out of certain countries at certain times, just how uh, tightly dependent we are on other countries who could absolutely pull the rug on us at any time possible. So guys, we're going to have a part two of this coming up uh, probably tomorrow uh, because I like to keep these short. I like to keep them bite-sized so that you guys uh, have time to, pay, you know, uh, digest the whole thing. Uh, and in the comments, you can ask us additional questions. Uh, Jordan won't be around for those because we will have already shot, but if they're good enough, we will get them on and answered. Uh, everybody else, like, subscribe, do what you do. Head over to The Limiting Factor uh, and uh, stay tuned, stay juicy, like a battery. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots tomorrow when Jordan joins us again.